Full disclosure, during this video I might sound a little awkward or insecure, and that's honestly because I hate the word series. That's because the plural of the word series is the word series, and that doesn't seem grammatically coherent to me. So when I say something like, look at all of these abridged series, I, I, I'm struggling internally to not have a mental breakdown. And additionally, I'm going to be saying a lot of Japanese words in this video, so that's going to be embarrassing for everyone, and I apologize. But before we get into the meat of yet another YouTube trend, I want to tell you guys about today's sponsor. Bombfell. Recently, I've been going through a huge shift up and down in the size of my clothing, so I've had to go to the store and buy new clothes, and that has not been a positive experience for me. It just seems like whatever looks good at the store doesn't look good at home, and, and even then, sizes are hard to tell in a changing room, and often I buy things that don't fit me. It doesn't help that I'm terrible at picking out clothes in general. When I was getting dressed for this video, I somehow picked out the one shirt that has a tear in space time. Also, this hat would look bad even if the rest of my outfit wasn't an empty void. The point is that Bombfell is an incredible service that helps men buy clothing in a much more convenient system. What happens is you take a quick poll and then you're matched with a personal stylist. After you're sent what they've selected for you, you have 48 hours to remove any items or make any comments or even cancel the order entirely. Bombfell then sends this order right to your doorstep. And you then have seven days to decide which items you want. Whatever you don't want, you send back to them, with returning shipping included in your order. But additionally, the more clothing that you keep, the higher of a discount you get. With more than two items, you get 10% off. With three, you get 15, and with four, you get 20. Bombfell always makes sure that you are in control. You receive clothes when you want, you keep what you want, and you can cancel at any time. All right, let's see what these guys sent me. Oh, look, it, it comes in little plastic things. We got this little pink shirt, gray shirt. It's got like a wave on it. I kind of like that, actually. And then we've got this little cute blue uh, sort of button-up shirt and this sort of semi-plaid button-up shirt. And then we have a Meet the Robinsons Pez dispenser. This is like some of the most incredible material I've literally ever felt on clothing. Like this is so nice. What is this? <laughs> sea foam. <laughs> Looks pretty good if I do say so myself. I was a little skeptical about the Pez dispenser at first, but now seeing the whole outfit together, I really think it adds a certain Jeanette says quai. To get $25 off your first order, go to bombfell.com slash Quentin. That's B-O-M-B-F-E-L-L dot com slash Q-U-I-N-T-O-N. All right, cue the abridged intro. By the early 1900s, cinematograph projector toys, which had been introduced in Germany, started to make their way into other countries, including Japan. Most all of the film reels which were sold for these projectors were also imported from other countries. That is, all but one. That film was created by an unknown company and mass-produced for wealthy households. It depicts a young sailor boy turning and writing out the phrase, Katsuru Shanshi, which translates roughly to moving picture. He then turns to the viewer and takes a bow. It is believed that this 50-frame loop, physically stenciled into the 35mm film, is the earliest surviving example of Japanese animation. The manga is better. Throughout the following decades, the art of Japanese animation would develop thoroughly, starting with numerous short films developed for brief use in cinemas. By the 1940s, Japan's military had begun commissioning nationalistic pieces to mold the public view of the war effort. This is what led to Momotaro, Sacred Sailors, the first feature-length animated film to ever be produced in the country. However, it wouldn't be until the 1960s, when the industry found its way to television and then to Western audiences, that the modern idea of anime would start to take hold. Osamu Tezuka's Astro Boy was certainly one of the most influential and widespread, finding audiences all around the world. It was also obviously a central inspiration for the style that would follow. Arguably, it was the 70s and 80s that showed the greatest development and success for the industry. These decades were home to the birth of the space opera anime, the foundation of Studio Ghibli and some of their earliest films, as well as such hits as Dragon Ball and Yu Yu Hakusho. It would be a great sin to discuss the development of anime and manga without bringing up the work of female mangaka Rumiko Takahashi. Her publications, with such hits as Ranma One Half, Yurosei Yatsura, and My Son Ikoku, were so immensely successful and well-received 
that it would legitimately be a challenge to think of a modern romance or comedy anime that wasn't influenced by her work. The point is that by the end of the century, anime had become famous for its recognizable and lovable characters, its gripping and overarching storylines, and its passion for creativity and world-building. It also became infamous for a lot of stuff. The first thing that you have to understand about anime and animation is that it's not as profitable as you think that it is. A lot of anime are created with the task of selling you something, and while brand deals have existed in the past, the main thing that they are usually trying to sell you is the source material. That's why so many adaptations never finish the final section of the story. Once a manga ends, something created out of a need for promotion no longer has a will to exist. Additionally, because animation created by a group of people actually takes less time to develop than a manga created by one person, it's very common to see filler elements added to the adaptation as to not outpace the original. Dragon Ball Z was extremely infamous for padding out episodes like this, expanding fight scenes several hours, and inserting entire arcs with no bearing on the actual plot, entirely for the sake of not outpacing the concurrent manga. It was through the need to pad out fight scenes and also to limit animation costs that a certain style of illustrating fights was created, where much of those scenes were dedicated to characters not in the battle, commenting on it and explaining what was happening. This would be used across the board in this genre of anime, and frankly it's so cliched that I find it hard not to laugh at it. It was all of these elements which led to the creation of a little show called Yu-Gi-Oh! For those of you who don't know, in its original incarnation, Yu-Gi-Oh! was a manga about a boy who finishes an ancient Egyptian puzzle, which then twists his personality into something dark and malicious, and gives him power to enact revenge on his bullies. Occasionally, he kills someone. But the second time it was being adapted, the plot was changed slightly to focus more on a card game that the characters enjoyed playing. This leads to sequences that are somehow in between compellingly surreal and egotistically boring, where two of the characters will take part in a card game and all of the other characters will comment on said card game, all under the tone of this being a serious fight to the death. In 2006, a fan by the name of Martin Billany created a short satirical dub mocking the series while also trying to cut down on most of the filler content. Villainy, known better by the name Little Karibo, would later note that his main process in creating the series was cutting down the card game segments and seeing what was left. He would then tweak the characters and dialogue to a more comedic tone. Wait a minute, did you just summon a bunch of monsters in one turn? Yeah, so? That's against the rules, isn't it? Screw the rules, I have money. The initial video was so well received that Little Karibo decided to make it into a full series. The main focus of the comedy tended to be the numerous plot lines revolving around the playing of a children's card game, as well as other very bizarre elements added in by four kids. Yu-Gi-Oh! Abridged was very warmly received and is honestly pretty funny. To quote the Know Your Meme page about the series, it is dubbed brilliance gave great lulls from the otakus to people who were basically unfamiliar with the show itself. However, it should be noted that Yu-Gi-Oh! The Abridged series is not the first dub of an anime to aim to mock the original. From the moment that Gojira became Godzilla, American creators had absolutely no qualms with greatly changing the Japanese source materials that they were adapting. And specifically, the appearance of animation is so vague that creators could greatly change the themes, tones, and even setting of animes without anyone really noticing. As we skip past numerous decades of Americanized anime, I want to talk about the one dub which actually seems to have inspired the phenomenon of abridging. That being the 2005 AVD Films dub of Ghost Stories. Ghost Stories had been a critical and commercial flop in Japan, and the people put in charge of dubbing it were basically told that they could do whatever they wanted with it. So they did. Bad memories. Listen, Satsuki, you only get a chance like this once in your life! Alright, who's first? Do you know how long I waited outside that room for him to finish? Oh dear god. Some of the numerous changes to the English dub includes changing a character who is psychic into one who is a devout Christian. Have you accepted Jesus as your personal savior? No, I'm Jewish. Insinuating that the main character's dead mother was a lesbian. Inserting constant fourth wall breaks, sex jokes, and offensive humor. This transvestite won't leave me alone! And making the youngest character literally spout meaningless babble half the time. <laughs> The English dub of Ghost Stories was highly contentious in the anime community, and since Little Kariba was very invested in anime at the time, I wouldn't be shocked if he had seen the dub. 
because in many ways all of Bridge series very much take a page from how those at ADV covered this adaptation. That Kaiba kid needs to get laid! No matter where you want to believe the craze of abridging started, it soon took off and many other creators started to make similar shows. The next most notable moment in the history of abridging happened in 2008, when the recently created supergroup Team 4 Star began releasing Dragon Ball Z Abridged. Well screw you two! Their power level is rising. So, nudity makes you stronger on this planet. Uh, no, we're wearing weighted clothing. Oh, of course! Dragon Ball Z Abridged was immediately popular because it managed to take the story of the original and retell it in an equally compelling way. But it did so with much less filler and consistently funny writing. And that was the great appeal about abridged shows. They mocked and shortened the source material while still making something that could be enjoyed by fans. It should be noted that while these are the two main examples of abridged content, there are countless others that I just don't have the time or patience to dive into. I mean, you got Naruto abridged, Pokemon abridged, Helsing abridged, Dangaparampa abridged thing, Code Mint, Nunpiece, My Little Pony abridged, My Little Pony Scooterix the abridged, My Little Pony the abridged series, Friendship is Witchcraft, Ultra Fast Pony, My Little Pony Friendship is for Adults, Friendship is Magic, the ultimate abridged series, and 47 other My Little Pony abridged serieses. Series. Fuck. If you weren't around at the time that these shows were popular, you will never grasp how widespread they were. One day you watch Death Note abridged, you come back the next month only to discover that there are now 22 Death Note abridged shows and none of them are the one you watched. To me, the most interesting aspect of abridged shows was the eventual inclusion of great changes to the source material. In Pokemon abridged, Brock was rewritten to be extremely creepy and uncomfortable. And to exaggerate this joke, they adapted the episodes out of order so that he just shows up with absolutely no introduction. This feels right. Hello, you. We're missing someone. In One Piece, Luffy is this teenaged, happy-go-lucky kid who just wants to do what's right. In None Piece, Purple Eyes What the Fu was inspired by Luffy's insane and constantly happy appearance to instead dub him as what he would later describe as botched Sean Connery. Oh god, I killed him! I won't go back to prison! My butthole can't take that abuse! Looks like I've got to kill all the witnesses! <laughs> Did you see that one, lad? His pancreas came right out his tear duct! Sword Art Online Abridged is one of the most recent shows that I'm going to be discussing in this video, and it's also the one that has improved on the source material the most out of all others. Many have noted that the show's take on the main characters and the universe is a lot more relatable and honest, and that its tone comes across as much less bland and tasteless. But that in itself brings us to the biggest issue that abridged content has faced online. A big change to this genre came with the emergence of copyright enforcement on YouTube. Just like in previous episodes, this means that a lot of content from this time is hard to hunt down, and many channels that are still with us today have been taken down dozens of times in the past. And at every turn, many have wondered why YouTube isn't as willing to back up abridged content as quickly as they would other shows. So the question is, are abridged series within the boundaries of fair use? No. A lot of people use satire parody clause as a defense for this type of content, but not only is satire parody clause not a thing, I don't even think fair use has clauses. Fair use is a set of four strongly worded factors with decades of precedent. The first two factors mainly deal with the purpose and monetization of the content. For today's use, I want to study the final two. The amount and substantiality of the portion taken and the effect of the use upon the potential market. To shorten and restate these qualifications, could you imagine someone watching Sword Art Online abridged as a replacement for the original series? Is there enough of the heart and the original product in Dragon Ball Z abridged that someone could pick that over the original show? Could people's impression of what Yu-Gi-Oh is be directly affected by Little Karipo's long-standing dub? And is there a commonality between fans of anime and fans of abridged anime? To me, the clear-cut answer to all of these questions is yes. Here's the meat and bones of my stance. Abridged content is not parody. It is artistic retellings. I think of them more alongside Teen Titans Go or the new Thundercats than I do Airplane and Austin Powers. They are unlicensed retellings which often have a huge effect on the brand perception of the original. And because of that, it should not be entirely shocking when extremely terrified companies constantly are taking these guys down. We've talked about fair use a lot on this show, and I've noticed that every time we do, you guys seem to presume that me saying that something isn't fair use means that it's evil. 
And that couldn't be further from the truth. In the past, I did a video discussing Neil Cesariga, a man who built his entire career off of adapting the work of other people. And in the end, I admire abridged content in the same way that I do remix culture or street art. This trend did to animation what expired copyright did to Sherlock Holmes. It allowed people with limited resources and no connections to adapt any stories that they wanted to and to show their creative sides where they might otherwise not have had that chance. On the topic of why this trend went away, it is, once again, basically the algorithm. Even people who have been working on these shows for more than a decade only average about six to eight episodes a year. And that's not necessarily apt conditions for success on modern YouTube. Sure, many of those abridgers have been able to make other content to keep themselves afloat, but it's very hard to imagine new creators in this genre rising up through the ranks. But besides from all those factors, a lot of abridged shows ended simply because the creators outgrew that project or stopped being friends with the people that they made it with. And while that's sad in a way, it's only a natural part of growing and moving on to other things. Thank you guys so much for watching. Until next time, I've been Quinn Reviews, and that's all you need.